The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, who hatest nothing that thou hast made, and dost forgive the sins of all those who are penitent, create and make in us new and contrite hearts, that we, worthily lamenting our sins and acknowledging our wretchedness, may obtain of thee, the God of all mercy, perfect remission and forgiveness, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Go ahead and have a seat. I, I don't know about you guys, I really enjoyed uh, Father Dahlman's presentation last week. It's a real joy to have somebody who truly has a depth of expertise on a topic um, be able to kind of pull from a million different places and uh, just, a, just a great uh, overview of Father Thornton's life and of the book uh, and a great conversation as well. So uh, I'm grateful for that. We're going to start, per usual, with a little bit of a dive into uh, meditation or mental prayer. I'm going to actually start in, in the Purple-Headed Mountain, then we'll go through this in conversation with the chapter, uh, and then continue discussion after that. I do want to say, I've, been, I've just been thinking about this in terms of these handouts, that the, if you've been to Adult Forum, where I teach an Adult Forum, and if you were sort of comparing it with how I do, how I preach, I try to, it's not that I, in sermons, I, it's not necessarily that I try to tie everything off with a neat little bow and leave out any complications. That's not the case. But in a sermon, I want a fairly clear proclamation of the gospel. And at the end of a sermon, there should be some sort of sense of having heard the gospel truth that therefore challenges your life. If you walked away from a sermon and your like fundamental response was, that, I don't know what to make of that, or that's just weird, or what was that about? That would be bad, right? That would not be good. I actually don't mind, though, if that's what you walk away from Adult Forum with, because Adult Forum is fundamentally diving into Scripture. In my, anyway, this is, this is the way I conceive of it, not obviously everybody, every, people will conceive of it differently. Diving into the data of Scripture without necessarily a sort of preconceived notion of takeaways or practical pieces of, you know, you know, three points of practical advice to get. The adult forum is much more to me of an open-ended dive into scripture. And scripture is weird. And sometimes the, the most natural response to a passage of scripture really is just a big question mark that you walk around the rest of the week with. What is that all about? I don't mind that. So there's a kind of neatness or, or clarity, neatness is not the right word, clarity to a sermon, a lack of unclarity even maybe an adult forum that I'm okay with. And here I'm trying to be somewhere in between those two poles. Not totally ambiguous and leaving things open-ended. Not that that's how adult forum is, but it's, it can be ambiguous and open-ended. And, but not also necessarily being as driven to tie things off in a bow and leave things neatly. And so these handouts are my attempt to sort of capture some of what Father Thornton is talking about, capture some of the background, but not necessarily declaring sort of authoritatively in a super concise way exactly what is. That's why I've kind of thrown it to um, folks in the room at times to say, clarify things with me, help me think through this. So I, 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 I uh, welcome that as well. Does that make sense? I'm not looking to declare to you what meditation or mental prayer is once and for, our, once and for always as a kind of authoritative word from the pulpit, um, more a, a, a sort of open-ended reflection. With that in mind, if you have the purple-headed, you should have the purple-headed mountain with you. Turn to page 74 with me. I'm going to read the opening paragraph, and then we're going to kind of go through this handout. So this is our, the beginning of our reading tonight. He says, when I suggested that to meet modern contingencies, it might be wise for lay people to use the daily office without the lessons, a position which as I said, I disagreed with, and I'll disagree with more tonight, but let's just leave that for now. I was careful to add that this did not mean that, that regular use of the scriptures was unimportant. Later, we concluded that meditation upon the person of Jesus was the best way to achieve penitence, the firmest basis for self-examination, and the source of moral theology. In short, that it trained the conscience. The schoolgirl conscience is quite sure that Jesus would never behave violently in church, and that he is always gentle with natural things. Meditation on the cleansing of the temple and the cursing of the barren fig tree forces us to modify this subjective and sentimental idea. Our religious outlook becomes more mature. In short, that in meditating upon the data of Jesus's life story, we come to expose 
elements of our moral theology that are more sentimental or perhaps more a result of cultural assumptions and less a result of who Jesus is in Scripture. And so he puts before you meditation on the person of Christ as the summit of Christian penitence, Christian self-examination, and Christian moral theology. I agree with him there. I think that's exactly right. But I do want to take some time to think about, well, what, what is meditation? Because he, again, he sort of assumes some degree of familiarity with it as a given. And to a certain extent, he's assuming a familiarity with meditation as it was commonly practiced in the 1950s and 60s in the Church of England. And so that's a little bit foreign from us. So what I did, what this handout actually really is, is the, a summary of a chapter in a book called Christian Proficiency, which I've mentioned a number of times, which is a great book, a chapter that is called Mental Prayer. And he goes on in here to say that he titled it Mental Prayer essentially to avoid what were then, he thought, common assumptions about me what meditation was. So by mental prayer, it's just another word, it's his way of saying meditation, but he was trying to avoid what he thought were the kind of common assumptions about what you hear when you hear meditation. There, his difficulties are different than ours. I think for us, if you were to, uh, like, what, what are the, you say meditation, what are the wrong places people might go? You could imagine, like, a, a Buddhist, uh, you know, Buddhist meditation or, or, you know, a Hindu meditation, you know, um, coming in one with the universe and losing a sense of self. That vision of meditation, which is not Christian, which has some commonalities with Christian meditation, but fundamentally is not. And so you might want to say, so, so essentially he comes up with mental prayer as a way of avoiding preconceived notions. It doesn't matter. I actually think he should just recapture, he should just uh, reclaim meditation and, uh, and, 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 and use that in the right way rather. If this makes sense, I'd rather him just keep with the same word but clarify what he means. And that's what he did earlier in the Purple-Headed Mountain. I'm not sure what happened in the 25 years between that made him... Uh, decide that he needed to drop the word meditation, but I'm going to stick with meditation. But if you ever pick up this book, you might run into mental prayer, and it's just such a, it's a, we honestly, it's a weird uh, phrase, what is like unmental prayer or something, you know. Uh, it just means meditation, it's a phrase he came up with. And he started this chapter with this wonderful little anecdote. He says, this is the quote at the top of your sheet, when I was about seven years old, this is from Christian Proficiency, when I was about seven years old, I bluntly refused to say my prayers because I did not see the point of talking to someone I did not know. And then he goes on to say, and here he says, without, condemning, without condoning such disobedience to a dear and worried mother, I still maintain that this is an extremely sensible stand to make. Uh, why would you bother talking to someone you don't know? He's a stranger. And so he introduces meditation not as prayer proper, not as this is uh, point 1A there, not, as, not the give and take of conversational prayer, but rather the kind of introduction to who Jesus fundamentally is that is necessary in order for a real prayer life to flourish. So it's the precursor, the introduction to prayer. It's an imaginative encounter with the reality of the living God in Jesus Christ that then enables true prayer to flourish. That's his vision of it. In Christian Proficiency, he goes on to say that it, that is meditation, can begin with an intellectual idea of God. You can reflect upon the reality of he who is, the source and ground of all being. That can be the beginning of your, of your meditation. Or with a simple imagined picture of the person of Christ. You can start with Sunday school images of felt board Jesus. That's not necessarily bad. We may see Christ with the eyes of faith in the blessed sacrament. And so as the, when, the, when, the, when the celebrant elevates the host and the, the uh, instruction manuals say to look and adore, that can be the beginning of, of, of meditation. We may achieve a recollected sense of the presence of the Holy Spirit. You can pause in your day and remind yourself that you are sustained in and through the work of the Holy Spirit. Or we can use some elaborate method of meditation. He says, it's a very personal matter. Med mental prayer, aka meditation, is thus a generic term for all the manifold ways and means of forming this initial introduction to God. He goes on in, this, in, in Christian Proficiency to suggest that there are three common stages of meditation, 
each good in its own way, each fallible in its own way, but ultimately hopefully pointing towards the third and final stage. He says the first is what, he, what, what, uh, what you might call the conventional stage of meditation, which is reflections on stained glass Jesus or felt board Jesus. It's just the kind of childhood image that you carry around with you and, and, and so you want, to encounter the, the, you want to encounter who Jesus is, and so you think about uh, stained glass Jesus. He says this is natural, it's not bad, but what it tends to be is completely abstract from your life. It tends to be, uh, he says, dressed up in sort of Middle Eastern garb, but really it's dressed up in what, you know, early modern artists thought medieval garb looks like, this kind of abstracted from both history and, um, and, and present day thing that can, can make Jesus impersonal. So he says that the next common stage is to recognize that Jesus could have come in a different time and a, pl- and a different place, and then in a sense he is incarnate in different times and places because he remains incarnate today. So you imagine Jesus in your present moment. The way that he describes this is as as though Jesus were lifted out of history, universalized, and then relocalized. And he says this is also good. I think, I'll just say, if you happen to read Christian proficiency, I, I think the second one is a little bit problematic to me because the sort of universalized Jesus then ceases to be the sort of first century Jewish Jesus. And can you actually lift Christ out of his context, lift him out of history? You can't, ultimately. But I think as an imaginative exercise, recognizing that ultimately Christ remains a first century Jewish man in some sense, as long as you recognize that, you can imaginatively imagine, think about, imaginatively imagine, oh geez. You can think about what it would look like for Christ to be present and incarnate today. What would the feeding of the 5,000 look like in a modern context? Does that make sense? You... Well, so he says, uh, Dr. Mary says, what would he be wearing? And he says, imagine, I didn't catch that, but something about Zachary and eating. The feeding of Zachary. The feeding of Zachary. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Uh, um, yeah, the feeding, the feeding of the five teenage boys. Um, <laughs> 200 penny worth, it's not, it's not enough. <laughs> no, I've totally lost my train of thought. Right, Dr. Barry says, what would he wear? Thornton, in this book, he says, well, imagine him wearing what anyone would wear in, in your sort of contemporary garb. What would Christ look like if he came in the 21st century? Uh, and, and he says that, that, that the immediate cringing at the idea of Jesus in a business suit or Jesus, you know, in, in jeans and a t-shirt, he thinks is actually, in part, that's a reaction of reverence. He would, I would say, at least. I don't know if he would even grant that much. But he would say that's actually a kind of dose, of t- a, a failure to reckon, it's a heresy of failure, failing to recognize that Jesus is human. So again, this would go back to, in the creed, we say he's fully man, but if we're uncomfortable with him wearing clothes that any contemporary American man would, meet, would wear, then to some extent we may be guilty of not wrestling with his true humanity. And I think that's true. While also, going back to a theme that we've been hitting on in adult form a little bit, while also recognizing that not all cultures are created equal, uh, that just because something's common today doesn't mean that it's equivalent to whatever was common 200 years ago. Um, just to, I don't know, throw a little bit of a minor, but this is the wrong crowd for this to be a bomb. I'd need to go to a different church. But if he were to, you know, show up in, in flip-flops and torn jeans, and if pe- people show up to church in t- flip-flops, torn jeans, and, and, a, and a ratty t-shirt, maybe it's just my, like, super stuffy Anglicanism, but I just don't know that Christ would do that. Maybe he would. I don't know. Maybe that's my own, like, snobbishness there going there. Um, maybe he would just to get me offended and then he'd, you know, expose me as a Pharisee. I don't know. What do you, what do you all think about that? Right. Zachary's getting us down to 3B there, (laughs) that the lives of the saints exist in some sense to do that for us, to say, what does Jesus Christ look like 
in this other place and time and circumstance. And so in, um, in the life of St. Francis of Assisi, you see Christ in a different context and circumstance and place, which does not, of course, make those saints perfect. They're not, and he critiques St. Francis, uh, Francis's errors, but in their saintliness, in their holiness, you see glimpses of what does it look like to be Christ in that circumstance. Right. Yeah, he, as, as when he's resurrected, sort of connecting the two comments, as Robbie said, he's like himself and yet also not like himself. And to connect to part C there, the third stage, I'll maybe come back to what I was saying in a second, but the third stage is to reflect on Christ ascended and glorified most profoundly in the transfiguration, which is a, a, in some sense a foreshadowing of those post-resurrection appearances where he is like and yet not like himself. He is identifiably Jesus, but not immediately identifiably Jesus, right? That Mary Magdalene and the two disciples on the road to Emmaus recognize him, but not right away. Uh, Mary doesn't recognize him until he says her name, which is one of the most like, beautiful sections in all of scripture. He says to her, Mary, and then she sees him or she knows him for who he is. And the disciples on the Emmaus say that he was known to us in the breaking of bread. He breaks the bread and boom, they see, they know who he is. So there's this like and yet not likeness to him, which suggests, I think, some of what um, Peggy's saying, which is that Christ, although he never ceases to be incarnate as a first century Middle Eastern man, is nevertheless capable of coming into our own context and speaking to us where we are. The, the thing I can, that concerns me a little bit about this one is that he arguably takes a, a borderline individual, um, you know, he sort of says, can you, you know, you have to imagine Christ doing what you do, uh, doing your job alongside you. You know, he was a carpenter then, maybe he would have been a factory worker today, which is to say, yes, maybe, but those are actually very different professions. And, and one of them, I think, is, is depending on the factory you're working in and what you're doing, may, may be less honoring of, of sort of human dignity than the other. Um, he certainly wouldn't be a factory worker producing abortifacient drugs, right, in a factory. Christ wouldn't do that. And so there's this kind of loss, I th- a little bit of a loss in Christian, at times of the sense that Christ doesn't just come into every culture, he also judges every culture. And he wouldn't just participate in the systems that he finds as he finds them. He would sort of challenge them. But I also want to hold open the possibility that, you know, that Jesus would surprise me, because obviously he would, and that I would be embarrassed about my certainties about what he wouldn't, would and wouldn't be doing and wearing. Um, yeah. And, and that can go sort of both ways. I think some of the people who are like, oh yeah, he'd totally be wearing those blue jeans to mess with you religious people. I'm like, no, I'm not so sure. You know, both of us would probably be like aghast and embarrassed that we were, had the sort of temerity to assume we know exactly how Jesus would be. And yet we also do have the story of the church and of the saints uh, to teach us what does it look like to be Jesus in other contexts. And the book of Acts, I'll just say, it is what we're doing in adult forum, is our primary grounding for knowing that that's what Jesus intended. He intended for the church to then be his hands and feet and to act as Christ, because that's what the disciples do. I did say my concern was that A and B, there's a, there's a certain failure of historical imagination, arguably, that his problem with A, this conventional stained glass Jesus, is that Jesus is abstracted, and so we sort of resolve it by, by contextualizing him in our own context, and then ideally both of those are transcended when we begin to see him in his glorified state. And I do agree with C, that's sort of the goal. But I also want to say that, and maybe this is my own sort of like prejudices as a former history teacher, that the way that we ultimately transcend the abstractness of the past is not by making the past part of the present, but rather by actually diving more deeply into the past so that George Washington comes alive not as he would have been if he were a 21st century American, because he wasn't, but we actually know enough about his context that he becomes alive to us as a real flesh and blood human being in his own context. Does that make sense? So the goal would be things like 
uh, the Lenten study last year, Brant Petrie's Jesus and the Jewish Roots of the Eucharist, where he comes, to, comes alive in that book to us, not because he's taken out of his context and plopped into ours, although again, I think that's an important part of our devotional life to actually consider that, but that he becomes most real and least abstract, not that way, but actually by diving into what did it mean for him to be a first century Jew. Does that make sense? So I think actually the way that we combat the abstractness he's talking about is in part by putting him in a modern context and remembering that he is in fact present in, in the modern world and that he does in fact have things to say to the modern world and he is in fact saying them. So that's not bad. I'm kind of, I feel like I'm maybe losing my train here. But the way that we, that we get rid of the abstractness of, of stained glass Jesus is ultimately by placing him in his true context, his, that is to say his first century historical context, not by plopping him into the modern world, devoid of context. Does that make sense? So he goes on to talk about meditating on the saints, and this one ties in nicely with a few um, moments that he has in this book. He, um, in, in, in Christian proficiency, he, he talks about, again, the same concern he mentions in The Purple-Headed Mountain, which is concerned that meditating on Our Lady in particular, because he takes, as the whole Christian tradition does, he takes the Blessed Virgin Mary as the peak of the saintly tradition and as the saint who is most worthy of our meditation, the Blessed Virgin Mary. He points out this concern about her getting in the way, that if you spend too much time thinking about Mary, then you won't spend enough time thinking about Jesus. And I want to acknowledge that there is some truth to that uh, and that I know some people who maybe I, maybe I should be less presumptuous, but whose devotion to Our Lady at times does seem to outclass their devotion to Our Lord. Um, but while acknowledging that that is possible, it's only possible, I think I would say, if you are, if you are doing it wrong. Like, meditation on Our Lady should never do anything except lead you to the foot of the cross. She, that is her posture, and if you're actually meditating on her, that's where you'll, you'll go. He says that concern about getting in the way, about Mary getting in the way, is actually a rejection of mediation. This principle that God doesn't uh, primarily beam into our brains unmediated, but actually he works through other things. So he works through scripture. We learn about God through scripture. We learn about God through creation. We learn about God through the images of God who are around us. We learn about God through the mass. That, through, that, that mediation is part of how God designed the world to work. That is to say, it's mediated. God, knowledge of God is mediated through created things. Does that make sense? And to reject mediation ultimately is to reject creation, which actually means to reject God himself, because A, God created it, and B, God became incarnate uh, in creation. And so, if, and, and I do think that that's a lot of folks that I run into are really uncomfortable with mediation. When you press into it, eventually, as the conversation turns, you do find a real profound discomfort with a God who created and a God who became incarnate. There's a sort of discomfort with those things. Um, I had students who had that, and I would always end up telling them, you're in the wrong religion. Like, you want, you want a religion that's unmediated. That's not Christianity. Let's find, you, let's find you the right one. Usually it was Islam, actually, interestingly enough. Uh, you don't like the Bible. You want, you want the Quran. Let's get you that one. That's the unmediated. Of course, I, I'm sort of being facetious, but, but that, there was a sense of dis, a real discomfort with the true Christian imagination, I'd say. And so he points out, which I think is true, that it is Our Lady's place in history, heaven, and the church that inviolably safeguards the truth of the person of her son. Apollinarianism and Arianism are both out of the question, if Mary is mother of God, so is deism. Uh, I meant to look up Apollinarianism. That, if I'm not mistaken, somebody correct me if I'm wrong, is the heresy that God, um, oh no, I'm totally losing it. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. You guys hear that? I said better repeat it for the. Yeah. Right, he's got a human body and a divine mind, so he's not fully incarnate. Um, Arianism is the notion that he's not fully God. So Paul and Arianism, not fully human. Arianism, not fully God. 
And how is, the, how is the note that Mary is the mother of God, how does that eliminate both of them? Because it affirms that Jesus Christ is God and also that Jesus Christ has a human mother. Isn't that wild? And so the, the fourth council declared that she is the Theotokos, the God-bearer or the mother of God, as opposed to the, other, the, un, the heretics who wanted to say, no, 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 she's, she's just the mother of the human being. He's, she's not the mother of God. And the Orthodox said, She's not the mother of Jesus in his divinity. It's not like she created the second person of the Trinity. But because in the person of Jesus, humanity and divinity are perfectly united, they become one, it's one person who perfectly unites the two of them. You can't, what's true about Jesus as man becomes true about Jesus as God. So we can say on the cross, we can say that on the cross, God died, which does not mean that the divine life ceased that would mean that nothing existed anymore. But it does mean that Jesus, who is God, died in his humanity. But nevertheless, we can say God died. And so Mary is the mother of God because she's the mother of Jesus, who is God. Does that make sense? No. <laughs> <laughs> Not so much. Yes. Right. So Mary is mother of God, safeguarding the divinity of Christ because she's the mother of God and also the humanity, because she's, she is the human mother of, of the human being, Jesus. And, and so that, that's why the council, it's interesting, all the Mary, all the, all the, the, at least in the first thousand years, all the affirmations about Mary are about who Jesus is. Mary must be the mother of God, otherwise, there, otherwise the truth about Jesus isn't true. And so our Mariology, our study of Mary, follows from our Christology, our study of Christ. And so we honor her as the mother of God because in so doing, we safeguard, the, we safeguard the humanity and divinity of Jesus. Thornton says, for instance, he, he says in, in Christian Proficiency that when you recognize the number of, the, the, when you meditate on the life of Christ, you include the scenes of Christ with his mother. And you cannot meditate on those without coming to love his mother. If you, if you do, that is, if you meditate on the life of Christ, if, if you meditate on the, on the scenes in the Gospel of Luke of, of Christ and his mother, and you don't come to love Mary, something is wrong uh, because she is such a um, beautiful caretaker of our Lord because of her devotion to our Lord. Uh, yeah, so, so he says that, that you would have to sort of falsely insulate your, you would have to sort of falsely wall off Mary from the story of Christ in order not to have some form of devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary. And then again, more broadly, the picture of the saints meditating on the saints, why, do you, why would you do that? Well, because ultimately the saints teach you what Christ looks like in another time and place and in other circumstances. Does that make sense? So you don't meditate on the saints just to meditate on the saints. You meditate on the saints to learn more about Jesus Christ uh, present in his church. Questions, comments? So then, uh, just the last few things. Some aids to meditation. That is, how do you go about doing that then? Well, you start with the Gospels. Those are not an aid, though. Those are, of course, the foundation of meditation. You can't meditate on Christ without data, and the Gospels provide the most basic data. And that's, to me, where the lectionary is so valuable. He says elsewhere in, in Christian proficiency that there. There is not a single, which I think is true, there's not a single challenge that faces you that is not somehow, however indirectly, addressed by the life of Christ. That the life of Christ is, it will connect to all of your cares and troubles somehow. And so that's one of the reasons for being familiar with the Gospels. Well, that's great, but if you don't know the story of the life story of Christ really well, then you won't, you'll be at a loss when you're confronted with something to know sort of where, it, where is it in the story of Christ to go. And so this is my sort of argument for the lectionary, again, as, the, as, as providing basic data. It's not really for meditation. That is, the, the readings at morning and evening prayer are not for meditation because you can't, couldn't do it in the time allotted. They're not for academic study because there's, no, there's nothing, no room for it in morning prayer if it's done sort of the way that it was, um, that it's most intended for, which is in the church. But it, what does it do? It reminds you of the stories. It just reminds you of the stories year after year after year, which provide then the data for meditation. I think study is a good precursor. Uh, maybe, I don't know if that's quite the right way to put it. 
It's both the thing that comes before meditation and after it. So he says that our, medita our imaginative meditation, he says in Christian proficiency, uh, it will be fine as long as we keep it safely within the framework of the church's rule that is inspired by grace, absolved, guided, and disciplined by moral theology. Within the life of the church, we may allow our imagination all freedom to imagine the life of Christ. Our mental prayer should be bold and adventurous. And I think that's true. I think uh, that, that if, if you are sort of um, living faithfully as a Christian, you do have a great deal of freedom in your meditative, imaginative encounter with our Lord, and you should be willing to, do, to allow your imagination free reign while remembering, of course, that what you happen to imagine does not thereby become elevated to canon, <laughs> you know. Uh, well, I imagine Jesus doing this. Well, that's not in the Bible, and you made it up. So, <laughs> so you, you, you give free reign while, while not assuming that you are inspired by the Holy Spirit in the same way that the canonical writers of Scripture are, right? Um, and, and what I would also say is that academic study is a great... Uh, foundation for that. Now, it doesn't necessarily have to be your academic study. That is to say, nobody's saying you need to go get a PhD. Uh, but your encounter with, with scripture studied academically is a great aid to uh, engaging imaginatively with scripture. Those are separate, separate things, but they help you. So when you understand what is Jesus up to in, you know, the, this gospel or that gospel, if you, if you understand it more deeply, then you can actually sort of more fully imaginative, imaginatively engage in the scene. And so something like Brant Petrie's Jesus and the Jewish Roots of the Eucharist, although in some ways it at times feels a little bit dry and academic, can be a wonderful uh, foundation for a more imaginative engagement with scripture. The stories of the saints teach you what Jesus looks like in different contexts. Art and iconography are helpful. He's a little skeptical of them. I'm not. I'll just leave it at that. Uh, east versus West. The East tends to take a very structured view of iconography as a vision into the present reality of the saints glorified. And I think iconography can be that. Uh, but whereas the West has a much more broad ranging uh, use of art, religious art. And, and the West is less, the West sees them as teaching aids rather than as almost inspired visions into heaven, which the East does. Uh, both of them would be opposed to iconoclasm, which I think, again, that the suspicion of images. And the suspicion of images, I think, ultimately is a suspicion of creation, but that's for another, um, another wine and wisdom. I already gave that one. I'll send you a link if you want to know that one. Uh, film and music can be aids to an imaginative encounter as long as you sort of are tentative about those, as long as you don't think that the Again, the, the Jesus, as long as you're careful so that, you know, like Jim Caviezel and the Passion of the Christ doesn't become your personal Jesus, right? Like if you find yourself imaginative, ima unable to imagine Jesus outside of the person of Jim Caviezel, he played Jesus in the Passion of the Christ, then that's become a problem. So I think you want to be cautious with those, but they're good. I think the St. Albans altar is actually a really great example of different forms of visual aids because you have the real presence of Christ in the tabernacle. You can't see it, but you know it's there. And even when it's presented to you in the Mass, it's, as, as one Eastern Orthodox theologian says, it's the real presence of Christ, but it's not an image of Christ, really. It doesn't look like Jesus' natural carnal self, but it is the real presence. And so you can have an, an, an imaginative encounter with Christ because he's really present in the sacrament. And then above, so, so the tabernacle on, on our altar above where Christ is really present in, uh, the, in the reserved sacrament, above that is the cross on which is the corpus of Christ, right? And that is an image of the, of the historical corpus, Christ in that past moment, reminding you that in the Eucharist, Christ is only, was only sacrificed once, one oblation of himself once offered for the sins of the whole world, and yet in the Eucharist, we, we don't sacrifice him again, but we do re-enter into that one sacrifice, and so you have Christ in the past, the historical past above that. And then at, at the top, you have the apocalyptic lamb, the lamb out of the book of Revelation, as if it had been slain on the book with the seven seals in Revelation 4 or 5. And so you have an image of the apocalyptic vision of, 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 of Christ in heaven, in the heavenlies, the past image of Christ the corpus on the cross, his real presence present with us in the present. And then off to the side, you have the iconographic image, 
present Christ, which in the Eastern tradition is Christ presently glorified at the right hand of the Father. Uh, and, and so I think you have this sort of wonderful constellation. And then you could also add in when the church is present, you have the mystical body of Christ coming up to the altar in the church. And so you have this kind of incredible combination of different pictures of, of Christ, different images of Christ present. And each of those offers you a different insight into who Jesus Christ really is. Yeah, right. And so in the celebrant too, that's a good point, is standing in persona Christi in the mass as in the person of Christ, declaring absolution, Christ is present in, in, in the celebrant. Yeah. Well, and then he points out too, in Christian proficiency, how there's two different forms of crucifixes. There's the one we have, which is most common, which is Christ uh, as he, in some, I mean, it's obviously it's imaginative, but a, as though he, as he were, was crucified 2,000 years ago. But you also have the wonderful um, Christ the King crucifixes, where he's on the cross, and yet he's in his royal regalia reigning, which connects with a, E.L. Mascal points out that when Christ stands before Pilate, it is Pilate who is judged and not Christ, and when he hangs from the tree, he's reigning, or when he hangs on the cross, he's reigning from the tree. This recognition that even in his crucifixion, he is still the Lord of the universe. And so you, you pair those together, and you get both the historical reality of his crucifixion, a human being who died on the cross, and yet nevertheless the Lord of the universe reigning from the cross at the same time. And I think when you sort of, I mean, there's just a, like an, uh, an amazing, I mean, I can also go like step outside of myself and be like, well, that's just a big bunch of confusion and chaos. Uh, that's just like a lot of different images and they're all like clashing into each other and just exploding in chaos. Sure. But I think it's better to think about what, what is th this sort of amalgamation of different images, each of which teaches you something about Christ and the reality of Christ present with us on Sundays. And so what do you do in meditation? Well, you simply, I mean, the simplest thing you, that you do is you block off some time in your life to reflect on the reality of our Lord. And, and I think probably the best way to do it is to pick something. You can pick the blessed sacrament and reflect on Christ really present in the Eucharist. You can pick the corpus. You can pick uh, the, the apocalyptic lamb, the icon. You can th reflect how Christ is present with us in the church assembled as the mystical body or Christ is present with us in the person of the celebrant. And then what Thornton most often highlights is Christ present in the stories of the gospels. And so reflecting, taking five, 10, 15 minutes and thinking meditatively on a story from the gospels. So this last week's the, the feeding of the 5,000, reflecting on the feeding of the 5,000, taking 10 or 15 minutes, not trying to figure it out study wise, um, but but reflecting on it meditatively and entering into the moment and allowing the moment to sort of um, enter into your historical present. So turning to the book, which we've been doing, uh, we've been sort of working through a lot of the data in the book as we go. I think I just wanted to uh, throw at you from both chapters six and seven, because I, I see those really six, seven, eight, and nine are all part of a single unit, are all, ref are all reflections on meditation in different ways. He uses the temptation, and then he'll use the Garden of Gethsemane, and then he'll use the story of Mary Magdalene as different ways of meditation. So in either six or seven, what stood out to you? What did you find interesting or problematic? So I think there's like three different, well, a, co a couple different questions in there. One is, how do you not wander off into heresy? meaning, you know, you end up imagining Jesus as not divine somehow or, or imagining him as not human. I think, I think this is where Thornton would say, if you are sort of in the life of, of the church, you, it doesn't, that doesn't insulate you from heretical beliefs, but you are in a context in which those will be corrected. So that if you, you know, come to church the next week and you're like, wow, I was meditating on how, uh, you know, uh, Jesus was adopted by God to become, the, become divine. And so it'll be like, whoa, 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 that's not, that's, that's a heresy. Uh, so you're in a context where that can be corrected, but you shouldn't be overly, yeah. In the moment of meditation, you shouldn't be like, you shouldn't have out your like, you know, Strong's concordance of the top 27 heresies in Christian theology. And you're like, well, I imagine Jesus looks, sounds a little bit like heresy number seven. Like, that's not the way to, to do it. So I think he would just say, try to relax. Uh, I, I definitely identify with that because my mind gets overactive and I get distracted thinking about 
whether what I'm imagining is correct or not. <laughs> but I think he would say, turn that off during meditation. Now, after you finished a sort of essentially set a time frame, I would say, 10 minutes, and then when you're finished with that, then you can maybe engage the analytical side. I think the second problem is, is just maybe not even being worried about heresy, but being unable to enter into it imaginatively because you automatically switch from imaginative to analytical. And I think that's just, you just have to sort of practice. You find yourself in analytical and then you say, oh, whoop. And then you sort of gently pull yourself back into an imaginative experience. Does that make sense? You guys catch that? Mm -hmm. Interesting too to think about where is water more precious? I could tell you from having lived in Florida and Arizona, more precious in Arizona. Actually, when I moved up to Michigan, I'd see people like turn on the water and then go wander to get their toothbrush. And it'd be like my like inner Arizona is like, oh, what are you doing? Are you insane? That's water. Uh, and so, yeah, there's a sense in which the wilderness actually teaches you the value of, of the life-giving properties of water. Right, right. Yeah, I had the same thing. I, the first place I encountered that was when I entered the Anglican tradition, sometimes on Monday, Thursday, there'll be like a holy hour meditation. And the text that, that we use were out of St. Augustine's prayer book, and then it ends just this very aggressive, now make your resolution. Uh, and and it, it is interesting. I think it's a good thing to keep in mind that meditation will often lead to a revelation of something you should do. But uh, yeah, there's a, I, I agree with Thornton there that there's, a, there's an artificiality in assuming that a meditative encounter with our Lord has to result in a definite resolution. It's, it seems to me like it, it gets at the kind of like, where he says elsewhere, like Jesus, uh, as God as divine schoolmaster, if that makes sense. Um, right. The resolutions come because as you encounter Christ, you realize things that need to change to, but yeah, that's the, the thing changing is, is the secondary. It's secondary to knowing Christ. Yeah. Yeah. It's, you know, it's just, it, the other thing I think about is how in my earlier days, I found the, <laughs> it sounds really terrible because it is, but the gospels were sort of a little boring and this is not like really young, but when I hit like a point where I was sort of an academically interested person, all of a sudden I was really interested in St. Paul's epistles and the gospels were kind of like, they're just stories, you know, they're not the real meat of like theological debate. You get that in Romans. Uh, I don't know why Romans isn't the high point of the new, t anyway. And I've so over like 10 or 12 years in the Anglican tradition, like without really thinking about it, suddenly realizing the, the, the gospel stories being really at the heart of everything. And then, you, I, and then it's not that I grew to appreciate the epistles or St. Paul less, but I understood that how St. Paul was working from the gospels, not building some abstract set of theological propositions, but reflecting on the same data of the gospels. What, is, what does this mean? And um, yeah, just interesting. Uh, yeah, the, li the, 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 the life story of Christ is, is the heart and everything else flows from it. Mm -hmm. Right. And not, not against his will. Like there's, there's no suggestion of the, even, even in the Garden of Gethsemane, the not why, my will but thy will be done, there's no real suggestion of that, which is not to say that it was pleasant to fast for 40 days, but that it was something fully entered into. Do, yeah, that, that to me, I think, again, there is an element of truth in the fasting is hard. And so Jesus what, would have been physically weak at the moment of temptation. So he says, you know, it contains an element of truth. But I, I think his vision is, is closer to the heart of it, which is that the fasting was preparation for his victory, not a way of, of, of putting the odds against him so that he could prove that even if you fast for, because I think that's maybe what I got is Jesus shows that you can resist temptation even if you're, even if you fasted for 40 days. Um, at your weakest, you can still da, 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 da. Well, that's true too, but that's not what's, I don't think, foremost. Does that make sense? The Lord be with you. Let us pray.
Father, thank you for this Lent and for a chance to consider how it is that we combat the world, the flesh, and the devil, and grow to love you more and more. And I pray that uh, this book would continue to be a service to that and that you would continue to bless our time together. We ask all this in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen.